Before the COVID-19 pandemic hit, I met Arun on the campus of New York University, where he's a professor at the Stern School of Business. This is where we discuss the evolution of the so-called platform economy. Well, I think the 2008 financial crisis certainly was a catalyst. Um, it allowed the new ways of earning money to be appealing to people who were either losing their jobs or looking to supplement their income. But the fundamental driving forces are, you know, not, you know, macroeconomic in some sense. They are technological. Um, you know, I think by um, like 2008 or 2009, um, digital technology had progressed to the point where you could put a powerful computer, the smartphone, in the hands of hundreds of millions of people. And so this enabled people to be able to rethink how they consume. You know, sometimes you had, in, in the past, you had to buy a car in order to have on-demand transportation. But now with a GPS-enabled smartphone in the hands of hundreds of millions of people, we could rethink how can we give people transportation. It doesn't have to be with them holding the asset. It could be through an on-demand model. And so the progress in digital technology and the consumerization of technology at scale was one of the critical driving forces. I think it was also us getting comfortable with digital trust. That was another key driving force because we've had online marketplaces for 25 years now and eBay created reputation systems back in the mid 90s. And these were sufficiently robust to provide the trust you needed to buy something low stakes from someone. You know, you buy like, you know, some, someone's secondhand stuff, you buy a pair of jeans, you know, maybe buy something collectible. The risks are relatively low. On the seller side, maybe you don't get paid. On the buyer side, maybe the article isn't as advertised as counterfeit, and you could lose money. But this is a very, lev a very different level of risk. But this is a very different level of risk relative to getting into a stranger's car and saying, drive me to another city or drive me down the block, or sleeping in a stranger's spare bedroom, or handing over the keys of your apartment to a stranger. So the new physical world services demanded a much higher level of digital trust. And um, you know, as Facebook and LinkedIn became popular, we had people's social capital that had been digitized and made available, real world social capital. And this is a critical component of getting people to trust each other. I think government IDs became verifiable online around 2010 or 2011. And so the components of the digital trust system that we could bring to bear were far more deep and far more robust than they were 10 or 15 years ago. And I think what's happened over the last five or six years is that people's own comfort with their ability to make an assessment about something that they don't fully understand based on digital information has grown dramatically because, you know, we've been reading TripAdvisor reviews before we go on vacation. We've been reading Yelp reviews before we go to restaurants. We've been reading Amazon reviews before we, um, you know, buy products. And so we've gotten good at saying, okay, this is the kind of review that, like, you know, speaks to me. This is a person like me. This is a fake review. Um, and we've done this over and over again and had largely positive experiences. And so the same digital trust information now leads to more trust, leads me to be able to take that leap and enter into this collaborative relationship with someone who I don't know um, at a much greater level because I'm more confident or you're more confident in your ability to make these assessments. And so the technological progress and um, like you know, the emergence of the smartphone and the maturing of the digital trust system and the maturing of the consumer as a digital consumer, I think are the, this is the confluence of things that has really led to the explosion of the sharing economy. Arun is the author of the best-selling and award-winning book, The Sharing Economy. It looks at how digital technologies are transforming business, governments, and society by changing the way we work. When you first started looking at this as a topic for a book, um, did you already see this world? Or is it just as, as you started kind of going along this path, it just kept growing and growing and growing? Well, what I really noticed was a pattern from businesses that I had seen in the past. Um, 
you know, I had been following YouTube for many years before I started to notice the sharing economy. And the similarity seemed interesting because YouTube has changed how we get video entertainment by delegating the production of content to a distributed crowd instead of it being produced only by TV or movie studios. And then I began to think about retailing, especially in China, where Alibaba's Taobao marketplace has changed the centralized department store to a platform with tens of millions of sellers competing for your business. So when I started to notice Airbnb and Uber, in some ways that pattern sort of sprung out at me. And it seemed like we were taking this model of crowd-based capitalism or of the platform economy deeper and deeper into the physical world. It wasn't just getting video entertainment. It wasn't just getting books. Um, it was getting a place to stay, um, getting like you know your transportation. And I think in the future, the way that we get education, healthcare, um, energy are probably going to be crowd-based and platform-based. And healthcare, obviously, you know, I think you pointed mm -hmm. out, you know, you're not going to get heart surgery this way, but there are uh, methods where uh, you see this actually happening, where maybe it's a cut finger or something like that. It's not as, not as major. Yep, I think sort of like, you know, in the future as the platform-based or sharing economy healthcare expands, certainly you're not going to have like major surgery assembling a team of amateur doctors who each have sort of read something on Medline or Google. Um, Doing it while you're in your Uber, right? Yes. yes. I mean, like, you know, sort of like, you know, you, at some point we're going to have the robots, but, um, you know, until then, I think the real potential is in developing countries and initially through telemedicine, um, where either you will have someone beaming in from another country over a platform, delivering higher quality medical care than is available locally, or you'll have them helping someone who isn't quite as qualified in your neighborhood but now is leveraging the platform, perhaps leveraging artificial intelligence to deliver a higher level of like, you know, health care for you than you otherwise would have gotten. It's interesting in your book you say uh, <clears throat> there's so many different terms, uh, crowd-based capitalism, sharing economy, gig economy, peer economy, renting economy, on-demand economy. So why did you arrive at your term that you liked the best? I mean, because you had so many to choose from. I know. Well, there are two terms that I've uh, chosen in a sense. Um, I feel that crowd-based capitalism is the best way to describe this new model of organizing economic activity. It really encapsulates what's different from 20th century industrial capitalism. Um, you know, we went through the 19th century where we created the telegraph, the telephone, the railroads, and then in the 20th century, mass production, mass distribution. And if you think about it, our model of how business is organized, our mental model is still a large company hires people full time and produces goods and services, selling them directly to consumers. And so when I saw this difference with YouTube, with you know, Alibaba, with Uber, with Airbnb, it seemed like it was still capitalism, but it had taken some of what used to be in the company and delegated, to, delegated it to a distributed crowd. And so that was my chosen term, crowd-based capitalism, but a lot of people were using the term the sharing economy, and so I borrowed that. And in many ways, it wasn't quite as descriptive of um, the phenomenon that I was studying because um, it wasn't sharing without money. It was sharing with money, and sharing always evokes this feeling of sort of holding hands and doing things out of the goodness of your heart rather than for profit. Um, but like, you know, when the book was written and, um, you know, it went to the publishers, the publishers told me, you can decide what's in the book, but we're going to decide the design of the cover and what the title is. We know sort of how to do that better than you. And so we went with the sharing economy. And, um, you know, it seemed like the title that best encapsulated what this phenomenon was in people's minds. And so, you know, I chose to be um, appealing to uh, like, you know, so that I wanted people to understand what the book was about rather than <clears throat> describing it perfectly um, in my academic way. And so since I'm an academic, I'm not a marketing expert, I delegated that choice to the, to the experts. The sharing economy is a model where goods and services are sold on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. It has a history of disrupting traditional business sectors from transportation to vacationing. 
The lack of overhead costs and inventory help share-based businesses run on the lean side, meaning more people are jumping into this economic model to make money. I saw someone say that uh, what's really interesting about this, I want to get your thoughts about it, is uh, this is democratizing capitalism in a sense and that uh, and, and they cited Airbnb that and in a lot of black neighborhoods where people might not have stayed in the past they would have stayed in the hotel in the center of the city now perhaps they'll and and so from an economic standpoint people who were, weren't really a part of the economy now are getting a piece of the pie do you see that as, as a as, as a piece of this that's of interest um, I see it as a huge benefit of the sharing economy I mean, I think it's democratizing in two different ways. One, instead of the money that you spend when you travel, um, going exclusively to a large corporation and its employees, um, a significant fraction of what you spend on an Airbnb goes to the host. The host tends not to be a super wealthy person. These tend to be median income, sometimes below median income people who are trying to make extra money by renting out their apartment or spare bedroom. And so in some ways, you're democratizing the ownership of capital because um, a lot of what an Airbnb host does is, and what they learn to do is what a professional hotel used to do. And so it's not as if you're just providing your labor on demand, right? You're setting prices, you're managing inventory, you're merchandising, you're doing customer service. And so millions of people are running tiny businesses through the platform, and it's democratizing in that way. Um, I also think it's democratizing in terms of, you know, spreading access to a higher standard of living. I mean, think about it. I mean, how many people could afford to call a car with a driver on demand before Uber and Didi came along? Um, that fraction of the population has expanded dramatically. There are so many more people who are taking vacations because Airbnb makes it affordable than before Airbnb emerged. And so, the idea that uh, we can only measure inequality through income and wealth um, is a flawed one, and I think one of the big benefits of the sharing economy is that we are allowing people who otherwise wouldn't be able to access these nice things that were only reserved for rich people to now sort of get a share of the access pie. So what does it mean for income <clears throat> inequality long term? Does it level the playing field, or is that still the playing fields like this now? I mean, yeah. Well, I, I think it's up in the air. I think that's going to depend in part on how governments sort of direct the platforms and the sharing economy. Um, if they direct it to favor platform models that are actually decentralizing ownership of capital, and by that I mean like, you know, allowing people to set up real businesses where they have control over like, you know, some of the key business choices like pricing and merchandising, where they can build a brand, in a sense, through a reputation system, where customers are choosing them if they do better, then this decentralization of capital will reduce income and wealth inequality over time. But if, on the other hand, we head towards a sharing economy where all of the capital, all of the know-how is held by the platform, and the crowd is simply providing labor on demand in the semi-anonymous way, then I think it could have the opposite effect. But I'm, I'm optimistic. Um, I think I've seen some good signs from some governments that they get it, and they're trying to sort of push the platforms towards the decentralization. Um, on the other hand, I'm, I'm sort of a glass half full kind of guy, so you know, I see the potential, the equalizing potential of the sharing economy, and you know, whether it's gonna be equalizing or not remains to be seen. More than 80% of Americans now own a smartphone, up from 35% just a decade ago. The shift has fundamentally changed how people find work and do their jobs. So it's interesting, I've got one of these in my hand. Uh, everybody yeah. does. Uh, is this a job creator or a job destroyer? I think it's an opportunity creator because it enables so many business models that wouldn't exist if um, you, know, you had to actually put a dedicated device in people's hands just for that work. You know, like 20 years ago, there was this company called Cosmo 
that was trying to deliver things to people on demand. If you wanted your blockbuster picked up, they would deliver it on demand. Um, if you wanted your food delivered from a restaurant that didn't deliver, they'd pick it up and deliver it to you. But they had to equip all of their workers with a special purpose device to coordinate with the company. Mm. I mean, today you can have those services because it's just an app on your cell phone. And so I think the number of ways in which we can organize work that is created by everybody having this device that can become part of their work life um, is sort of dramatically empowering for the workforce. As the sharing economy grows, state and local regulators face policy concerns as they address the growing impact of platform companies. You're talking about government. You're also talking a lot about education. You know, the, the, you know, when I went to school, you learned certain things. You go into broadcasting. You, at one point, I was an entrepreneur. I didn't have those kind of skills. That wasn't something that was embedded in in my thinking. We've got to rethink how we educate. We've got to rethink benefits. We've got to rethink a lot of things because of this shared economy, right? Absolutely. I think in terms of the government's involvement in the sharing economy. Um, you're right, I think they started out by just saying, hey, this is something different, and then they sort of jumped in without really knowing how to regulate it, and now there's a strong push to try and um, fit these new business models into the old regulatory boxes. I think part of what makes this challenging for government is that this isn't some gee whiz new artificial intelligence service. This is transportation, this is housing and accommodation, this is healthcare, things that have been historically regulated at various levels, at the federal level, at the state level, at the local level, um, for decades. And so it's hard to imagine government simply saying, hey, you know, we're going to keep our hands off. But I think the key piece of understanding that governments need to sort of wrap their heads around is that the platforms are not in the same businesses as the other sort of companies that they are disrupting. You know, they may be in the same industry, but they are not actually directly providing the services. They are facilitating the provision of services by the crowd. And so Airbnb is facilitating the provision of short-term accommodation by six million hosts. In many ways, Didi is facilitating the provision of transportation by a distributed network of like, you know, 10 to 20 million drivers. And so the approach that I always ask the governments to consider is to think of the platform not as the protagonist, not as the object of regulation, but as a partner who can help craft a 21st century regulatory solution where the government has some oversight and maybe is helping set the rules, but a lot of the responsibility for regulation is delegated to the platform because they are closest to how the business is being run they have the most enforcement capability. If you think about it, like Airbnb can cut off a host by simply blocking them. And so you sometimes want to give regulatory power to the person who can enforce. And so we are at the early stages of a large scale sort of redesign of our entire regulatory system. And where I'm hoping we end up is a solution that treats the platforms as partners and not as the people who have to be regulated. Um, you know, I think as we move into this economy where there is like, you know, a larger and larger fraction of the workforce that is not working full time, but is somehow is running a small business through a platform as a micro entrepreneur of sorts, um, it does make us want to think carefully about how we are educating our youth. I mean, like, you know, I've, I've been an educator for a long time. Um, I've seen undergraduate education change a fair bit, but I don't think we've gone far enough in teaching people how to think entrepreneurially, um, teach people how to, you know, design their own reality in some sense. You know, it's not going to be that common in 20 years for someone to graduate and then plug into a corporate machine that tells them you join as an analyst and here are the steps up the ladder. Um, instead, most people are going to have to shape their own careers. And I think learning about design thinking in college, on even in high school, can help put you in the right mindset where you're not expecting that other people are going to solve your career path problems for you, but you're doing it yourself. 